Good afternoon. I'd like to call the City Council meeting of July 12, 2016 to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Councilmember Dominguez. Hart. Here. Hodgkiss? Here. Murillo? Here. Rouse? Here. White? Here. Mayor Schneider? Here. And item one. Proclamation declaring July 15, 2016 as Sister Cities International Day. Well, great. And this is... Um, Good timing. We have a group here from Weihai, China, one of our sister cities that are here. And uh, so I want to acknowledge them. They're going to speak at public comment, but I uh, wanted to say hello to you. And, and congratulations to the Puerto Vallarta Santa Barbara Sister City uh, Committee that's received a national award from Sister Cities International that is going to be coming up this week, right, at the conference. Sister Cities International was founded as a presidential initiative by President Dwight D. Eisenhower on September 11, 1956 at the White House Conference on Citizen Diplomacy to create more community-led global relationships so that people of different cultures could appreciate their differences and build partnerships that would lessen the chance of new national conflicts. And in 2016, Sister Cities International is celebrating 60 years of global citizen and civic diplomatic action and helping support a future where the world's cities, communities, and its citizens can come together in common ground. And Sister Cities International currently has 550 U.S. member cities, counties, and states with relationships with over 2,100 communities in 145 countries, spanning six continents, having representation in nearly every district representative in the House of Representatives. And countless cities, county, and state governments and their leaders have been involved in global relationships that include educational, economic, cultural, municipal, and humanitarian assistance exchange programs that are mutually beneficial to each community due to Sister Cities International. The City of Santa Barbara and the Santa Barbara branch of Sister Cities International are proud to be a driving part of this global network with Sister City partnerships in Dingle, Ireland, Cotor, Montenegro, Patras, Greece, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, San Juan, Philippines, Toba, Japan, and Weihai, China. And Sister Cities International Day is a fitting occasion to commemorate the significant impact that the organization has made in building bridges across nations, cities, and communities around the globe in order to create and sustain world peace. So therefore, I, Helene Schneider, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Santa Barbara, California, do hereby declare July 15, 2016 as Sister Cities International Day. And thank you all for all the work that you do uh, on, for Sister Cities around here and around the world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On, be on behalf of Sister Cities International, that I represent in Southern California. Thank you very much, and we're very proud to be celebrating our 60th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. And I, great. I would just like to add thank you, Madam Mayor, and members of the council for your support over the many years of Sister Cities. Great, thank you, Mr. Brock. And I believe Takako Wakita and some others are gonna be uh, at the conference later this week, and they'll be uh, accepting they're in Washington right now. Great. Fantastic. Okay, item number two. Employee Recognition Service Award Pins. Mr. Casey. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Each month we write to recognize city employees for achieving milestones in their years of service to the city, and I'd like to read their names into the record uh, to recognize them. With five years of service, Stephanie Burgard, Animal Control Officer with the Police Department. April DeBlas. Police Officer, Police Department. Scott Derfor, Assistant Parking Coordinator, Public Works Department. Andrew Freytag, Police Officer, Police Department. Brock Maudlin, Police Officer, Police Department. And Alan Tuazon, Police Officer with the Police Department. With 10 years of service, Kathy Fry, Associate Planner, Parks and Recreation Department. Teresa Lawler, Engineering Technician 2, Waterfront Department. And Stephanie, Stephanie Rudier, 
Engineering Technician 2 with the Public Works Department. With 15 years of service, Lisa Arroyo, Wastewater Systems Manager, Public Works Department. Lynn Burrich, Senior Engineering Technician, Airport Department. Tim Lawton, Community Education Liaison, Airport Department. Robin Newbert, Administrative Specialist, Fire Department. Carrie Stevens, Legal Secretary 2, City Attorney's Office. And Jeff Zampezi, Fire Engineer with the Fire Department. With 20 years of service, Kent McBride, Police Officer, Police Department, and Scott Nelson, Webmaster, Administrative Services Department. And with 30 years of service, Chris Woodcock, Fire Captain with the Fire Department. Thank you. Congratulations to all of them. Um, we don't have any pins to give out this time around, uh, but we want to thank everyone for their service. Okay. Any changes to the agenda? No, Madam Mayor. Okay. Public comment. I have a number of speaker slips here. We're going to start with our guest from way high. Um, Whomever would like to represent all of them, come on up and introduce yourself and welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Sheldon. Uh, I'm part of the Santa Barbara Way High Sister City uh, Association, and I'm also an assistant principal at San Marcos High School. Um, I got involved with the Sister City Association in uh, 2009 when I made a trip to Way High China and taught English there during the summer. And uh, previously, our exchange had just been teachers going to Way High. And after that, we started a program where uh, we brought um, high school students uh, from Way High to Santa Barbara to study English, to uh, learn about uh, Santa Barbara um, as a cultural exchange. And we have our third group um, since then here uh, right now, which I'd like to recognize from Way High. Um, they can all stand up. So. All right. Whoa. Welcome, all of you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd like to thank the mayor and council for having them here, and this is a great experience for them seeing how our Santa Barbara city government works, and uh, they're also taking classes at San Marcos High School through the Education Foundation Summer School. Um, we're spending some time on State Street doing some shopping, visiting UCSB. Uh, tomorrow we'll be at Stearns Wharf uh, next week, and we've, we've seen all the sites of Courthouse and Presidio and such. So thank you very much for uh, hosting us, and uh, we look forward to continuing to uh, develop our relationship with Way High uh, China. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheldon. Thank you very much and welcome. <laughs> okay, okay uh, we have next Tony Wellen, and Larry is here donating your two minutes to Tony, so you have up to four minutes, Tony, and after that will be Lizzie Good Rodriguez. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Good, a Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and City Council. Um, this is a statement. Uh, from the Coalition Against Gun Violence. Once again, our nation is experiencing shock, numbing grief, and profound sorrow because of gun violence. The hearts of Americans are heavy with the burden of the tragedy that unfolded in Dallas. The Coalition Against Gun Violence extends our condolences to the families of the slain and wounded officers in Dallas and to the families of Anton Sterling and Philando Castile, the latest black victims killed by gun violence. We are all touched by gun violence and must acknowledge that though all lives matter, the violence in this country against black men and women and children has continued unabated since the time of slavery. People of all ethnicities must have equal justice and equal respect. Racism and inequality long ignored in America has reached the boiling point. The supporters of Black Lives Matter come in all colors as well they should. We must reflect that I am my brothers and sisters keeper as we all are members of the human family. What lessons must we learn? How will we heal the divide? It is all too obvious that when a peaceful protest becomes a moment of terror due to a hate-filled man with a gun, it is impossible to remain silent. The man who demonstrated the power of peaceful protest, Martin Luther King, was killed by a gun. The NRA's mantra that a good guy with a gun can stop a bad guy with a gun was tragically disproved. The proliferation and easy access in most states to military-style weapons and large-capacity magazines 
has caused the often hazardous job of law enforcement to become deadly. This is not the job they signed up for. We are fortunate that California has the best gun violence prevention laws in the nation. After a school shooting in Stockton, assault weapons were banned in 1989 in California. And just a few weeks ago, this city council, and we commend you highly, banned large capacity magazines in our city, and they are banned in the state as well. Every day, 90 people are killed by a gun in America's gun violence epidemic. There are more guns than people in this country. Therefore, it is finally time for the gun lobby to learn that through the voices of all Americans that guns have not made this nation safer. In the process of grieving and healing, let us learn to understand with compassion for everyone and reach out with loving arms and not with firearms. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next is Lizzie Rodriguez. will be followed by Jared Schwartz. I'm setting my timer. There's a timer right there. Ah, okay. Good afternoon. My name's Lizzie Rodriguez, and I'm representing the Restorative Community Network. As I stand here today, our nation is engaging in critical dialogue around racial justice. This weekend, Hillary Clinton stated that our country, quote, must confront implicit bias. Council, you and I share a common goal. And I think it's safe to say that we all share this goal, that we want a safe and welcoming community for everyone, particularly our young people. Unfortunately, that's not the case for youth of color in our community. Black youth in Santa Barbara are four times more likely to be arrested than white youth. Latino youth are one and a half times more likely. That's not because there are more black or Latino youth. This is on a scale of a thousand per thousand. So the reality is we are experiencing racial injustice. We are experiencing implicit biases. Now, I don't blame our police department. I have a lot of respect and admiration for our department. In the last few months, I've had a lot of interaction, and I found them to be quite concerned and caring about our community and about our youth. But the fact remains, we have racial disparities in our community. There's no one single entity that can be blamed for this. There's a long history of racism in our country, and Santa Barbara is not immune to that. I spent the morning in the Santa Barbara Juvenile Probation Department sitting with probation officers, intake clerks, and service providers on a implicit bias training. We took a self-assessment to find out where our racial um, judgments and biases lay. I was surprised as well. But we're missing a critical element, our police department. It's important that our frontline staff also have this self-awareness. You need to wind up, please. As President Obama stated just hours ago, <coughs> discussing implicit bias in law enforcement is not an attack against cops. He said, addressing implicit in bias allows us to live up to our highest ideals. Thank you. Jared Schwartz will be followed by Judy Can Stevens. Can I just address the, uh, the speaker really briefly? Ms. Rodriguez, if you can come back up. I'm really, I'm really glad that you spoke. One thing I want to make sure that's clear, though, because someone may interpret what you said wrongly, is um, those, are, those are great stats, and I'd love to get copies of those. But usually when the police respond to a call, they're responding to a call that the residents of Santa Barbara make, so we've got to make sure that we're focused on, uh, on that group of people as well. So when you're talking about four times as likely, one and a half times as likely, I'd love to hear more about how that results. Is it because people are calling when they see a person of color in the street? I want to make sure it's clear it's not the cause of the police department. And you said that, so I'm just reiterating what you said to make sure it's clear for someone who's not paying close attention. What used to be playing outside is now considered loitering for youth of color. Okay, Jared Schwartz will be followed by Judy Stevens. Good afternoon. My name is Jared Schwartz. I'm the executive director of Just Communities, a local nonprofit based here in Santa Barbara. In 2011, Just Communities and some community partners uh, conducted a series of trainings for all Santa Barbara Police Department uh, sworn officers and other personnel. 
The focus was on how to more effectively serve lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered members of our community. The training combined work on implicit bias, cultural proficiency, and practical skills and tools. Evaluation of the training showed that the training resulted in significantly higher rates of confidence on the part of officers to work effectively with LGBTQ community members, significant increases in objective knowledge of LGBTQ issues, an overwhelming consensus that the training was extremely helpful and practical, and numerous officers and detectives who reported after the training that they were able to immediately implement their learning to positive effect in their practice and in their jobs. After the training, Just Communities recommended that we do a similar type of training on how to more effectively serve the Latino and African American members of our community. While that training did not move forward at that time, we believe in light of both national headlines and local data that this training is even more important today as police community trust and relations are even more fragile. We therefore recommend a combination of implicit bias training, cultural proficiency training, and police community dialogue to improve trust and relationships between the community and police. We've utilized this kind of approach in other communities to great effect, and we've been partnering with the Santa Barbara Unified School District with similar work that's shown fantastic results in improving uh, outcomes for Latino students and reducing uh, racial and ethnic disparities in, in our academic settings. Just Communities is available to advise, to assist, and to conduct training such as this. We'd love to explore the possibilities further, both with the department and yourselves. To this end, we're also part of a national network that's developed a new uh, type of implicit bias training and is looking for several cities around the country to pilot this work. We'd love for Santa Barbara to be a pilot site. Thank you very much for hearing us today, and we look forward to talking with you more further. Judy Stevens will be followed by Jan Ross. Madam Chairman, members of the council, in the light of what has been happening in this country over the past few weeks, it is hardly necessary for me to point out that we need a well-trained and culturally sensitive policing policy and practice in our city and all cities. The proposed anti-bias training that the last two speakers have discussed is a means to that end. I support it. I hope you will, too. Thank you. Jan Ross will be followed by Stephanie Jemgushin. Gushian. Hello. I'm here today to join the conversation about how our city helps make our citizens safe. And I thank you and our police force for having a conversation with the leaders of the demonstration on Sunday at the courthouse mourning the death of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, and for assuring us that you are all willing for that conversation to go on. I also mourn the officers in Dallas who were killed. In an effort to promote understanding for all of us, I urge city council and our police officers to educate us about what policies are now in place regarding use of deadly force and what training is usual and how this is decided. And if we decide changes are needed, perhaps of the, no, the kind that were just spoken about, please listen to all of us from our community. I'm grateful that our city and surrounding communities have had, not had a great deal of racial violence. At the same time, I know people here who have been stopped for driving while black or driving while black, brown or walking while black. It's going to take all of us working together to make sure this doesn't happen anymore and to make sure our city is truly just a safe place to live and to work. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie, um, and please um, correct me on the pronunciation of your last name, which I'm not going to say right now. Uh, and, uh, and then Liz Zock. Jam Goshen. Thank you. <laughs> Jam Goshen. Awesome. That's a hard one. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Stephanie Jamgosh, and thank you for um, allowing me to speak um, before City Council. I, I, too, am also here to voice my support for racial and ethnic disparity uh, red training um, for the Santa Barbara Police Department. I'm here as a citizen of this community who has great concern about the recent tragedies surrounding the killings of two black men by law enforcement officers in Minnesota and Louisiana and conversely with the backlash killing of five officers in Texas. Training law enforcement in implicit biases 
is an important step towards racial justice and closing the gap of disparity. Training in implicit biases helps to mitigate inherent biases. Santa Barbara, the Santa Barbara Probation Department has already taken an important first step in providing red training. And I think uh, you heard from Lizzie the, the statistics about um, higher rates of, uh, of uh, youth, um, excuse me, um, racial disparity is happening right here in Santa Barbara and um, encourage us all to work together and do something about that. Thank you. Liz Zock will be followed by David Diaz. Thank you. I too am here to support strongly the implement implementation of the racial ethnic disparity training for our local officers and staff of the police department. Um, we all know there are enormous disparities in the treatment of people of color by law enforcement officers and in our criminal justice system. My eyes have been heartbreakingly open to the white privilege and institutionalized racism that exists in our country, and I would really like to be part of the solution. I'm hoping that people of all races and from all segments of our Santa Barbara community can work together to help affect true and lasting change, and that includes each of you, our elected officials. Being a beneficiary of white privilege is something I never asked for and which something I do not want. It goes every, against everything I think our country supposedly stands for. And it goes against everything that I strongly believe as a Unitarian Universalist. Our core values include recognizing the human worth and dignity of every single person, as well as the need for justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Racial ethnic disparity training for Santa Barbara Police Department seems like a really good first step, but I'm hoping for more, for ways in which I personally can help in this work. Madam Mayor and honored members of our City Council, will you commit to working on this issue with Just Communities, the Restorative Community Network, and citizens like myself? Thank you. David Diaz will be followed by Jean Alexander. Good afternoon, Santa Barbara. Um, first off, what I've done in my life, and I taught my kids, talk to all law enforcement officers on duty, and when you see them in restaurants, just say hi, and that's the best way to have an open communication to see that there's a level playing ground, irregardless of your race. I mean, if you have the communication, then there should be no barriers because at least we're interacting with each other, letting you know that we care about each other. And I think that's one of the secrets that's never been taught in school since I was a kid in elementary school. But I learned it from hanging out at the fire departments here in town as a kid. Now, second, last week there was a news article on TV. They had a little program. And um, it was City College with the city of Santa Barbara finding, trying to figure out housing and work out the complications with the kids at City College. Well, like this group that was here, EF Kids, said, um, if we had a law saying that you have to be 18 years old, we'd have tons and tons more room for our local students and students attending from out of the region coming to stay and have affordable places in Santa Barbara. But until we decide to have these packs of kids, because when they leave, like they're in the back, there's about seven or eight of them just on their phones together. They hang out together and they run and do things. They're lost, they're mystified. Yesterday I was on the phone talking to a friend on the bus, and these two kids came up to the bus driver at stop time. He just stopped real quickly. He goes, hey, where's this? Where's that? I'm going, come on. We're not the international babysitting center of the world. Let's do something about it. Now, secondly, the Sherpa fire, all the glory, all the concerns were shared, but um, I was called on on the third day. Um, what happened was three hours after the fire begun, I was at the Patterson Freeway Bridge, and I called the liaison for the National Forest and said, hey, what's happening with the fire? He had no idea because he was in the valley. We were brought on three days later, and push came to shove. It turned out um, their bulldozers desecrated three sites, sacred sites, and um, we had to go in there and talk, and the district ranger for the Los Pinos district said, well, our concern are lives and property. I go, yes, I agree with you. I'll, I'll vote for you. I'll have half the town go for you as mayor. But it's over, so I'll Thank continue you. next time, I Thank promise. Thank you. I think Mr. Dominguez has a question Mr. for you. Diaz? Mr. Diaz? Are you aware? Excuse me. I can't do that because I want to respect the Brown Act, okay? You're fine. You're no, fine. No, no, you can no, answer no. You just, can answer a question well, under the Brown Act. Well, I don't want to violate state law. You're not violating state yes, law. Yes, it is. 
I'm going to no. make a statement. You don't, you don't need to answer <laughs> Unless it. Unless you right, change you can, the law in Sacramento. It's fine to answer I just question. want to make sure you're aware the uh, police department has a community academy, and they do it in both English and Spanish. It's open to anyone. And it's a great opportunity for uh, community members who are interested in, in anything related to law enforcement, really, but particularly in this moment in time, to go and uh, gain more understanding of what our police department does. I think it would be a great experience for anyone who hasn't already done it. Uh, Chief Cromback was at the last... Um, uh, giving of the class. It was the Spanish speaking one. And so we were both there. It was great. And, uh, we had a ton of people from uh, the East side and West side taking part in, in it in Spanish and they were really enjoying it. And it's, I think it's one of the great things that Santa Barbara really offers to its residents. Thank you. We still have some public comment speakers and I know chief Cromback, you want to give some updates as well. And we'll do that after the public comment. So Jean Alexander, uh, and then Katie Alexander. Hi, I'm Jean Alexander, and I've been an attorney in private practice here in Santa Barbara for the past 35-plus years. Um, I'm active in the community also. I've been um, supporting and developing restorative justice programs, especially in the juvenile justice area. And I've also been working with youth on probation through the Alternatives to Violence Project and Encuentros programs. Um, I have great respect for the police, and I appreciate the vital and very difficult job that they do. I'm also aware, however, that some officers are not immune from racial bias. And I've heard firsthand through my community work from Latino youth and their parents regarding some police practices they've encountered. A couple examples, um, stopping teens when they've done nothing illegal, questioning and intimidating them, putting their name on a list that can later be used against them or others. Uh, labeling Latino teens as gang-affiliated based on very weak evidence. Uh, following kids on probation, sometimes staking out their homes, trying to catch them up on any pretext to arrest them. These are some of the stories that I've heard. And I think that the white community has no idea that this happens because they don't experience this generally. And um, this double standard isn't fair, and it's just also not good for our community. Uh, it leads to increased gang membership, I believe, because kids will join gangs um, for protection if they become incarcerated. And it leads to a rack, lack of respect for police within the Latino community and racial tension generally. And it leads to a community that's less, less safe and less happy. So I'm all in favor of um, implicit bias training. I wish the whole community could do it, but I think the police department is a good place to start. And finally, I want to say that there are a number of people from my church, Trinity Episcopal, here in support of this. I'd just like to ask them to, to stand. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Katie Alexander and then Jennifer Burquist. Hi. Uh, I'm a teacher at San Marcos High School here in town. Um, and I've had a chance to participate in uh, and facilitate trainings for teachers around racial and ethnic disparities through just communities. And I've seen how transformative uh, these programs can be in terms of recognizing and addressing subconscious racial bias in our teaching practices and how they're really helping to shift our school culture to, so that students of color feel safe, welcome, and academically challenged on our campus. Um, I've also had a chance to facilitate programs around racial and ethnic disparities with students, and I've heard many stories from youth of color about times they were targeted by police in our community uh, and received different consequences than their white peers for similar offenses. They've shared that their families often feel unsafe calling the police in times of need. And I've talked to white students who have realized that they've been giving, given second chances and the benefit of the doubt and treated with more respect by police than their classmates of color. I hope that our police department will follow the lead of our school district in engaging in cultural proficiency training and taking action to create a more safe and equitable community here in Santa Barbara. Thank you. Jennifer Berquist will be followed by Kathy Swift. Hmm. Afternoon, Madam Mayor, Mayor and the uh, members of City Council. Um, I am a former teacher. I'm Jennifer Burquist. I forgot to introduce myself. A former teacher. I'm a current advocate for children and their special needs and their um, needs as, as um, small children, zero to five. And um, I'm here in favor of the implicit bias training, but I just wanted to say that I think that as a community, we need to think in terms of starting with our young children and working with um, and having these conversations throughout 
the year, the early years and throughout the later years and um, in support of, of um, the racial ethnic disparity training and specifically. So thank you very much. And that's not for all the children to discuss that, but just that we should have these conversations about ethnicity. Thank you very much. Kathy Swift, and we'll still have some more public comment speakers, but maybe after Ms. Swift, Chief, you could um, give some updates. So Ms. Swift. Hello. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit today about the problems that are going on with the racial profiling, again, of um, low-income Latino and black communities. And um, I want to start with a quote by Stokey Carmichael, who says, if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. If he has the power to lynch me, that's my problem. So it's a question of the difference between attitude and power in racism, and a lot of times people are not getting that. So there's a tendency to conflate those two and to think that there is this thing called reverse discrimination and that the police are being discriminated against these days. Um, in fact, in 2015, over 1,000 poor blacks, Latinos, and low-income whites were murdered by the police around the country. We have the highest police homicide rate in the entire world. We have the highest incarceration rate of low-income whites, blacks, and Latinos in the entire world. It is a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions. And so I want to say that, yes, I support just communities for their racial training for um, the Santa Barbara Police Department. I think that's one step. But I also think that we need the civilian oversight committees that oversee the operations of the police department so that we can end the official corruption that has been ongoing. Um, Santa Barbara here has had a problem with um, for-profit ticketing in the past, and we can say that we can see that in the case of Casey Butel. I think there was even an, an article written in the Independent about it, in which this police officer and other police officers are making money off of ticketing typically low-income Hispanic people in the community. So there needs to be some way to end official corruption in the police department, and one way we can do that is through a civilian oversight committee. Thank you. Uh, Chief Crombeck, do you want to give some updates? I know you've been talking with a lot of the members here today about this issue since last week. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, in, in going back, and uh, it, certainly it's um, it, events that occur often on a regional or national level percolate these issues to the surface in, in communities such as ours. And going back and looking at some training, and, and I could really bore you with a lot of statistics, which is going to be meaningless in light of what we have heard. And uh, so in 2011, 2013, and 2014, officers have gone through training on sensitivity, um, racial profiling, and bias-based policing. And so while these are also state-mandated, they're done out of a spirit of ensuring or trying to demonstrate to a community our commitment to providing a safe community without the bias. Uh, however, in, in um, what I have learned in my career and in my experience in dealing with communities of color, I policed a community of color for 25 years, and the, we discovered gaps, and in, in the police can say what they do, but if the community doesn't understand then there is a, a huge gap. And so we engaged in some training where we trained the police and the community together. And, and then an education occurred, a dialogue occurred, and relationships were built. Uh, I certainly don't want to ever see local police uh, perceived as an invading army where we come in and impose our will on the community. That's not what we're here for. We are here to... in partnership with the community provide and build safe neighborhoods. I'll go back to the 18th century when Sir Robert Peel, who's the founder of the modern model of policing, said, and I'm paraphrasing, but the police are the community and the community are the police. And so we are really one together. But, you know, when you listen, and that's oftentimes what needs to happen is to listen to the voice of the community, it demonstrates a significant chasm that exists that needs to, uh, one, we need to engage in some type of a dialogue uh, to meet with and listen and understand where people are. Uh, there will be differences. Um, 
I believe that we need to start with what we agree on and work from there and then how we fill those gaps. And it's going to be the key to, um, to gaining that cooperation and partnership with the community to continue to work together to provide a safe community. Uh, what exists today is uh, it's sad, but it's the way it is, and we need, to, um, we need to be an active participant in those solutions. And so it's something that's going to have to happen together the police and the community together. And so if there's training, if that's the solution, then that would be a component of it. And, and we're certainly uh, committed to moving in that direction. Thank you. Ms. Maria. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, I'd like to thank Chief Krumbach for providing uh, Captain Marazita and um, Mary, Arroyo. Mary Linda Arroyo. Um, who met with Lizzie Rodriguez of the Restorative Community Network and with representatives from the Black Student Union a couple of days ago, and you said that you would be willing to sit down with representatives of the community to discuss their concerns about the need for training and hiring practices and whatever concerns they have. And I know we have a new police chief coming in, but if you would bridge that um, communication um, we're, the mayor and I were in that meeting, very grateful that there was a, a community discussion before the, uh, the vigil this weekend. And uh, thank you very much. Madam Mayor. Yes, Mr. Casey. I'll just mention that I, I spoke last evening with uh, Chief Lunau, who's going to be starting on Monday. And she's very aware and sensitive to this issue as well. And I've committed her to having dialogue with the community about these issues, and she brings some fresh ideas and perspectives on training she's done with the San Diego Police Department as well. So this will be one of her top priorities. Great. Mr. Casey, thank you. If, if the new chief is, I would defer to whatever, however she wants to go forward. I just wanted to recognize that Chief Krumbach was willing to, to meet this week. It's urgent uh, for some people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a little more public comment. Speakers, I'm going to do... Um, it, well, okay, Chief, briefly, Chief is up please. Here. The, um, I just wanted to point out again, having open communication is great and, and having people understand what departments are trying to do. Right after I just started and then you started a few days or a few weeks later, I discovered there was a community relations grant. And it was a great grant that would allow us to do some things, but it was due in three days. <laughs> and I'm like, let's try it. And Chief went out of his way to talk to some people he knew who might be able to, to write it up, and, and they said, you know, it would take like a month. And uh, he found out, you know, that there'd probably be more money rolling into this in the next cycle, and he's very supportive and pointed out some of the good things that would come of this. And, and Paul Case, here, city administrator, was on the call too. So these are efforts that we're constantly doing that the public doesn't necessarily see that would provide this type of training. And this grant was for, I think, $200,000. So that would provide significant training, a lot of it, which would pay for some of the programs that people are talking about today, which I think we all support. So I just want to bring that stuff to the surface because people don't hear about that. The press doesn't report about it, and people aren't aware about it unless we bring it up. Okay. We're going to finish up public comment. Thank you. Um, Jonathan is next. It will be followed by Andrea Roslinski and then Marta Cruz after her, Michael Baker, Raquel Vela, and the final speaker will be Adi Barkin. Hello. My name is Jonathan, um, and I work down on South Quarantina Street in a light manufacturing zone. And I just wanted to raise a couple issues um, and seek guidance on those issues as well, because I'm not sure exactly how to proceed um, with the city. But one is we're right behind the Fest Parker, kind of by the Hamburger Habit there on South Quarantina Street, right across from Marburg. And we have all the garbage trucks coming with all the dirt and dust and everything. And it's probably the dirtiest, dustiest, most unsanitary street in the whole city. And it's not even swept. There's no street sweeping uh, signs or anything like that. And before we had um, RVs, we couldn't park um, on the street as well, which was another issue. Um, because, for example, if we want to start a business, then say it's a restaurant, then we have a certain amount of parking that we have to um, comply with or provide for our customers or our employees. And Marburg doesn't have any assigned parking, so nobody can find any parking. So our employees, people we work with, other people in the complex, it's maybe over 50 businesses in the area, they have to walk for blocks um, on streets with no parking, uh, no, uh, no sidewalks through like the dusty streets, the cars go by, they whip up, 
all the dust. People don't like to bike because of that reason, because it gets in their eyes. And I just wanted to ask what was the best way to really go about fixing uh, two of those issues. I think you mentioned five different departments in those minute and 30 <laughs> seconds. So I would just suggest perhaps emailing it, uh, your concern, either to myself or Mr. Casey, and we can start figuring out the details from there because they'll go to different people depending on the topic. Okay? okay? Perfect. And you. Uh, you can go into the uh, city administrator's office to get our email addresses and things like that. Okay. Thank Excellent. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Roslinski? And then Marta Cruz after her. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and City Council people. Um, yeah, I was really devastated. A lot of times I just turn the sadness and devastation after um, gun violence. I really think we should be more like Denmark, where they only um, have guns out. People have to rent guns for their hunting seasons when they have certain holidays. And in Japan, where they only have guns for... Uh, no civilians have guns, but I don't know how to change that. But so I did a prayer, a little pray. No, let's not do the prayer. I'll just do the poem I wrote. It's called Clean Slate, just about everybody to try to um, live together in harmony. Um, why do we choose to hate when we just don't relate? Why not try a debate so I don't have to feel your hate? We can wipe away the slate clean. Wait, we can wipe the slate clean. You can choose not to be ignorant and mean and make a scene wherever you go. You're not afraid to show your hate for the blacks, the Jews, police, or anyone different from you. You're the one that's going to lose in the end. Don't be saturated in your hate. Um, you can all start a clean slate, and that's the end. And uh, I think that's a good idea, yeah, to have more progress by all working together. I don't know if they have the coffee with the cops, stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, we don't need uh, AK-47s and all that uh, in, like, Ventura, maybe gun shows and stuff like that. I don't know how to uh, stop that. Thank but, you. All right, peace. Martha Cruz and then Michael Baker. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor and City Council. I have misplaced my regular prescribed glasses, so I have my prescribed sunglasses. Okay. Uh, I applaud the effort of the Santa Barbara leaders regarding community racial, ethnic education and awareness. But I'm here um, to appeal to you and call your attention to addressing alternative housing for those in need. The city is proposing an ordinance to prevent some campers and RVs from parking on Santa Barbara city streets. I am here today because I attended a meeting on Saturday where I met different face, a different face of homelessness. I met uh, working citizens who live uh, in campers and who are unable to secure housing. And I hope that you can reconsider your proposal or perhaps add certain measures to it that will address these issues um, because there is a need to expand the safe parking spaces, the timing, and also, most importantly, not to criminalize people who are living in RVs or those who are homeless who are trying to make an effort to become productive citizens. Thank you. Michael Baker and then Raquel Vela. Afternoon, Mayor and Council. Michael Baker, CEO for United Boys and Girls Clubs. Uh, I wanted to just give you a quick update, a couple things. Uh, it's been a um, summer's been off to a good start for us at the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, just just to reiterate for those at home that are watching that uh, have not seen a report before, uh, this is a perfect example of a public-private partnership. Uh, City-owned building, a Boys and Girls Club is is helping to manage, and we're averaging a little over 100 kids a day, um, and another public-private partnership with through the uh, food food program at the school district, we're also able to serve, on average, 140 breakfasts, 140 lunches, and 140 dinners every single night. Um, again, that's totally free for the kids that are coming to the club, and anybody that's over 18 years old is uh, $4 for, the, for their meal. Um, we focus in the summertime on what we call summer learning loss, and we, we know the fact that we have boys and girls clubs all over the country, we get a lot of uh, good information that we can, we can pull from all of our clubs all over the country. And we know that the typical boys and girls club member across the country, by the time they, because they're coming from a lower income family, most of them, by the time they enter the sixth grade, we know that because of summer learning loss, 
uh, and, the, and the fact that they're, they're not as engaged in activities in the summertime, uh, they are, th by the time they enter the sixth grade, they are three years behind in their reading and writing skills on average. Uh, so we have a major emphasis that we're doing summer programming, what we call summer brain game, gain, and uh, we're mandating that every one of our members participate in these activities and helping to combat, combat summer learning loss. Uh, and I, and I do, I do want to end by, by um, also stating the fact that I've um, been here about almost 19 months and I've worked in communities that are much bigger than Santa Barbara, and some communities are much smaller than Santa Barbara with Boys and Girls Clubs. And I can tell you that uh, the relationship that we've had with the police has been fantastic in the time that we've been here. And, and they've uh, done a great job in coming in and interacting with our kids in the club facilities. And I uh, just want to thank you for that, and hopefully we can continue. And anything we can do to, to help bring uh, everybody together, we're, we're here to help. Thank you. Raquel Vela. Hello, everybody. I come in in peace, okay? <laughs> I'm not a troublemaker now. I only come in for say thank you because I sweep Carrillo Street between Bat and Carrillo and Castillo. And I collect in my garbage and put in the metal. And I call to the, to the public works. After three weeks, I come in, in here last week and I found the, I don't know who is the person, okay? And I say, this is my problem, blah, 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 blah. And I'm very surprised. When I come back between here to my apartment, the garbage is gone. Thank you. And besides, and Placido, between the alley, the Bat and Castillo, you know the little, see? all the time I have probably a store, dishes, clothes, mattresses, and everything. And I, all the time, I call to the office and triumphantly put a sign. I know, nobody respect. Because till this morning, I found it a big carpet, mattresses. I don't know where is it. I'm sorry, and somebody is insulting, but I've been involved for more than 40 years. And it's very frustrating. All the time, say, the public, at the public, what about us? What about don't communicate one another and work together? It's the false all the community. Push the community. And I recommend somebody put in the news in Spanish. You are in Spanish. Okay? Put in, in Spanish in the notice. This is going on in the town. Because everybody clean the hands. No, it's... Uh, uh. And here in Santa Barbara, nobody loves me. But I don't care. I don't like myself. Thank you so much. Thank you, And thank you for everything. And it's still working. Probably I take the new police academy. I take it in 85. But I need to go and renew my education. Thank you so much. Thank you, Raquel. And congratulations to everybody. Thank you. And Final speaker will be Addie Barkin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, making this opportunity available. Um, my name is Adi Bark, and I direct a network of progressive uh, local elected officials from cities around the country. I moved to Santa Barbara a couple of years ago uh, because my wife got a job at uh, UCSB. Our offices, our main offices are in New York and Washington, D.C., and this past weekend we gathered in Pittsburgh for our fifth annual national convening, 100 progressive elected officials from cities all around the country, including St. Paul, which uh, witnessed a the terrible shooting um, of Philando Castile, uh, uh, one of our board members from New Orleans, uh, and, and the uh, city council member from Dallas, whose district uh, where, uh, saw the, the assassination of five police officers. Um, and they all came together um, and stood up um, for building a more just and equitable society. Uh, they stood up at, at the beginning of our conference to take a pledge to stand against Islamophobia, which has kind of been rising over the past year. Uh, because of the rhetoric of Donald Trump and, and right-wing Republicans. Um, and we broke our police reform uh, breakout session to join um, with marchers in the streets in Pittsburgh 
um, uh, to stand for Black Lives. Um, so I just wanted to say, uh, so the, the organization is called Local Progress. I'll email all of you a link uh, if you'd like to join. We've also written a toolkit um, for promoting justice in policing, which lays out a series of 15 different steps, best practices from cities around the country that cities can take to improve their policing practices. Um, I think, you know, we, we all have biases. Uh, we don't need to be ashamed of them. We're products of an American society um, that has been built on racism, and we, we shouldn't be ashamed to confront that. Um, so I'll email it to all of you and would love to have you join the network if you're interested. And I just want to say, as you take on this question of bias in policing and police reform and oversight and accountability, you'll be standing with members from around the country who are doing the same thing. Um, and you should be proud to be part of that movement. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, members of the City Council. Thank you. Okay, that concludes public comment. And we're on to the consent calendar. Uh, Look at the and the Okay. Okay. Can Raquel, Miss Mendoza, if you could, we'll take care of that. Well, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> she forgot her lunch. Got it. All right. Okay. Um, thank you. We have some items to read on the consent calendar. If you could read those. Item 4, Introduction of Ordinance for City Administrator Merit Salary Increase, recommending that Council introduce and subsequently adopt by reading of title only an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara amending Ordinance Number 5706, the Salary Plan for the City Administrator for Fiscal Year 2016 and Fiscal Year 2017 to provide a 5% merit increase effective February 6, 2016. Item 5, Introduction of Ordinance to Approve Two Encroachment Permit Agreements Related to Peabody Stadium Project at Santa Barbara High School, recommending that Council introduce and subsequently adopt by reading of title only an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara approving an encroachment permit agreement to allow Santa Barbara High School Peabody Stadium facilities to encroach within portions of city lands underlying a vacated portion of Figueroa Street, an untraveled portion of Figueroa Street, and a vacated portion of Salsa Pueda Street, and also approving an encroachment permit agreement to allow other portions of Peabody Stadium facilities to encroach within an untraveled portion of Rinconada Road. Both agreements with the Santa Barbara Unified School District, the owner of Santa Barbara High School at 700 East Anapamu Street, Santa Barbara County Assessor's Parcel Numbers 029-180-009, 029-240-003, and 029-240-008, and authorizing the Public Works Director to execute same. And Item 15, a resolution denying the appeal and upholding the decision of the Planning Commission granting approval of a 90-unit affordable housing development at 251 South Hope Avenue, recommending that Council adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara denying the appeal and upholding the decision of the Planning Commission granting approval of a 90-unit affordable housing development at 251 South Hope Avenue pursuant to Council's direction of May 3, 2016. Thank you. Without further objection, we'll wait for the reading. Um, there's some lights on Mr. Hart. Did yes, just like to take number four. Hold number four, Mr. Dominguez. Okay. Uh, Ms. Murillo? I, I need to vote separately on item 15, please. Okay. Uh, and Mr. White, you wanted that. And, and there was also questions you had on 10 and 13, so we'll get those. Why don't we go in order? So item 4, Mr. Hart? Well, I appreciate the job that Mr. Casey does, and um, I think he's doing a great job. And But I cannot support this increase in addition to the 5% raise that this agenda item um, includes. Um, the city administrator is eligible for a 3% raise, which all city managers are getting. And so the combination to me is just excessive, and I can't support it. It's more than a $10,000 a year raise just for the 5% increase by itself. Okay. Mr. Dominguez? I'm going to likely abstain on the issue only because uh, I started my term in January, and most of the period this covers was last year. Okay. All right. So we need a motion for item 4. I move item 4, Madam Mayor. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, and one abstention? Okay, so it's 5-1-1 with um, opposed Hart and abstention Dominguez. Okay, and 
I just want to say item 8 is the community promotion contract with Old Spanish Days, and I see uh, Ms. Henderson in the audience just waving. I just want to acknowledge uh, the partnership. I was uh, on the Double Dolphin today uh, because they announced who their Grand Marshal is going to be for the parade, and it's Jean-Michel Cousteau, which is very exciting as it leads to the coastal frontier, which is the theme, and so that they, uh, if you haven't seen the poster yet for this year, it's a uh, perspective from the sea looking at Santa Barbara based on at, from 1790 and we took the double dolphin or I didn't they did um, took the double dolphin to the spot where the perspective is from the from the painting with uh, Mr. Cousteau and members of the board so um, I just wanted to acknowledge that and congratulate them on that announcement and we don't need to vote on that separately I just wanted to mention that uh, Mr. White, you had a question on item 10, which do, is the I contract do. for downtown parking structures assessment. I do, and, and my question is this. Uh, the, uh, we have a facilities management uh, system within our city, and this obviously is a substantial investment, and I'm wondering whether there's any cross-breeding uh, or cross, a crossover between our facilities management, and Mr. Dewey's shop, et cetera. And, and this, it would seem to me there's quite a bit of uh, uh, commonality there. Just asking staff about that. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member White, I'm Chris Toth. I'm the division manager here <clears throat> with Transportation Division. And with that, uh, this assessment is uh, with a company to take a big global look at all of our facilities, our, our parking structures. And we have an existing maintenance management system with that, computerized maintenance management system. It's Cartograph uh, is the name of it. Uh, you may recall City Council just approved uh, a new contract with Cartograph for an upgrade to their software. So we... So downtown parking, with its parking structures, will be transferring old cartograph information to the new cartograph software. So yes, we do have an asset management system for that, and it's cartograph. I do have staff with me here today if you have any more detailed questions about that. Well, again, uh, yes, thank you for that. And uh, my, my question has to do with the fact that we have a, a facilities management system in place, and it would seem to me that there would be uh, uh, expertise there, and that I'm not hearing that that's uh, being applied to these parking structures. And I just Madam Mayor, Council Member White, I'm Rebecca Bjork, Public Works Director. Um, our facilities is uh, unit is really focused on doing the core work of maintaining our city buildings. The inspection of the parking structures is fairly technical, a specialized expertise, looking at concrete um, wear and providing recommendations for long-term maintenance as well as expectations for long-term um, projects in order to keep the parking structures in, in good structural operational um, uh, condition. So it's, it's specialized expertise beyond the in-house expertise that we would have in our facilities division. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And then, and then you had a question on item 13, which is the, why don't you read item 13 if you could. Federal Aviation Administration Airport Improvement Grant Offer for Santa Barbara Airport. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you. And my question here is that um, it, it seems like an awful lot of, awfully large portion of this is being uh, dedicated to entitlement funds, i.e. Half, half the total uh, expenditure is on uh, design and permit, and at least that's what I'm getting from this uh, from the staff report here. And it just seems that seems like an awfully high uh, number. So I wanted to get a little more uh, information on that. The uh, Tom Buller's Airport Department. The the item here is for the design portion only. Um, this grant is about three hundred ninety thousand dollars. The grant is three hundred sixty thousand. The total cost for design is about three hundred ninety thousand dollars of that five point five million dollar total cost. Well, that's much better than I see uh, the two two million seven hundred thousand. Did I miss something in the that, that where I'm just not seeing reference to to three hundred thousand as the design, which is you know five percent of the cost, and that's a that's a ten percent would be a kind of a a generic number. So five percent would be great, but um, 
the, t- the 2.7 million was obviously. 2.7 is the actual amount that we're entitled to, um, but you don't have to spend the full amount. You can roll it over into the next year, which is what we plan to do to fund the construction next 100, year. 100,000 of it for the design, et cetera, and we're getting $2.7 million of total of the 5.5, which will be rolled over into next year's uh, funding as well. Correct. Okay, that's a little clearer. Thank you. Okay, and then um, item 15 is the resolution about the uh, appeal at 251 South Hope that was already read. So um, I think right. Mr. White and Ms. Mario, you called this one out. Right, and I think that Ms. Mario and I both uh, voted against this project uh, at the time, and my concerns are I, I know that there's a way to do this project uh, while honoring the, uh, the setbacks uh, in the uh, creek there, and uh, I, I think we, that's how the project should be uh, moved forward. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, with the utmost respect for our housing authority, I was, I was hoping the, the project would be set back further from the creeks as well, so the creek. Okay, so can we have a motion from item 15? So moved. Okay. Second. Moved by Rouse, second by Hotchkiss. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. No. Okay, that's 5-2 with White and Mario opposed. And so can I have a motion for the balance of the consent calendar? Move the rest of the consent agenda. Second. Moved by White, second by Hotchkiss. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, uh, item number 19. Contract for construction of Arroyo Borough Creek Restoration Project at Barger Canyon. Okay, Mr. Cameron, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Cameron Benson. I'm the City's Creeks Division Manager. As you all are aware, the Creeks Division has a pretty significant capital improvement program uh, with projects throughout the city. We have several projects in the Arroyo Borough Watershed. Uh, that are at different stages of uh, moving forward. Today, uh, Aaron Markey, our creek restoration planner, will be uh, describing what we're going to be doing up in the Upper Royal Borough Restoration Project up in Barger Canyon, which is, uh, as you'll recall, a a property that the Creeks Division purchased in December of 2013. And um, I will turn it over to Ms. Markey. Thank you. All right, um, Madam, May- Madam Mayor and Council Members, thank you for having me today. Um, as Mr. Benson just mentioned, uh, I'm going to be speaking to you about our Upper Royal Borough Restoration Project at Barger Canyon. Um, the project site is located in the headwaters, um, the upper portion of the watershed along the main stem of Royal Borough Creek, uh, on a parcel that was purchased by the Creeks Division back in 2013. Um, this site was... Um, noted in previous reports to have um, active erosion and bank instabilities and therefore was a target of future restoration activities. Um, Both the goal of the restoration project and our previous acquisition uh, are to improve watershed health through the restoration of this portion of the creek um, while also providing watershed protection into the future. So here's a zoomed in look at the parcel. Um, The city owned parcel is shown here in red. It's 14.19 acres and spans both banks of Arroyo Borough. And at the time that the property was acquired, a conservation easement was negotiated over the creek side portion of the neighboring property shown here in green. This protects an additional roughly one acre of creek side habitat and also allows for our restoration project to continue um, an additional 350 feet um, downstream along the creek. Um, Uh, This is a recent aerial photo of the site and um, some of the existing conditions our project seeks to remediate. Um, In order to illustrate how some of these conditions arose over time, I'm going to run through a series of historic images, um, starting with the oldest photo we could find from 1928. You can see that right away there are many more large mature trees on the property at this time, uh, as well as the lower portion of the the creek on this property is in a completely configure, completely different configuration uh, than it is today. Um, we assume that the property was grazed at this time, and given that context, historically untouched, we probably would see even additional um, much canopy cover and shrub cover on the site. Uh, moving on to 1954, we start to see some development encroaching in on the property. Barger Canyon Road is in its current configuration as well as 192 and Foothill. 
Uh, you can see there's a number of trees that have been removed from the watershed um, since the previous photo, especially along this middle section of the creek. Um, and although development is starting to come in, you, you do notice that the, the lower portion of the creek still maintains some of this natural meander or sinuosity that our creeks and rivers have. Uh, moving on to 1966, uh, we see our most drastic change as the property was converted to an orchard. And um, the creek was significantly impacted by this as all riparian vegetation was removed from the creek corridor. Um, if you zoom in closely, orchard um, trees are planted right to the top of bank. In addition, uh, sometime in the last 12 years, the lower 600 feet of the creek was completely straightened, shown here with this red line. Um, so we no longer have that kind of sinuous nature that we, sh we showed in the previous photo. Um, a small home has been built as well. There's development starting to come in on the property itself, a small home located right here on the East Bank, as well as seven different bridge crossings um, that cross the creek and a road all along the East Bank. Um, and so we, we assume that it was in this era that a number of the existing uh, bank hardening features, there's sections of concreted banks, pipe and wire revetment, um, riprap along the banks that um, a number of these features were likely installed in this era in order to prevent, uh, protect some of this development that occurred at this time. Um, when in reality, these bank hardening features actually lead to um, increased erosion and channel incision downstream um, and destabilized creek banks. Uh, so moving on to more present day photos, uh, the property actually remained as an orchard until 2006 when the previous property owner came through and cleared um, all of the orchard species off the property, as well as did some additional clearing of, of native vegetation. Um, this small home was still here in 2008, um, but the following year in 2009, the Hesazita fire came through this area and actually burned down this canyon, um, completely burning that home as well as a number of other um, structures and trees on the property. Um, so given the context of the current conditions on site, uh, the restoration project aims to improve the ecological value of the site uh, by reestablishing a more natural stream channel in this lower portion of the watershed, uh, reducing erosion by laying creek banks back and revegetating them with native species, as well as removing all unnatural hard um, bank features from the site. Um, in addition to improving riparian conditions through native plantings, we'll also be um, targeting and removing non-native perennial species from within the project area. We have a question for Mr. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand. Remove all unnatural man-made structures? From this property, yes. So there's a number of bridges that we will be taking out um, concrete. Well, I just wonder, what's a natural man-made structure? <laughs> are we just being redundant there? I guess we are just okay. being redundant. That's, yes, I thank understand. you. Thank you. Um, so through these efforts, the project will uh, not only improve wildlife habitat on site, but will also improve watershed health uh, through reduced erosion and improved water quality. Uh, the Creeks Division has been working with Cuesta Engineering to develop the designs for this project. Um, to orient you, we've shifted our orientation counterclockwise. North is now to the left and Foothill Road is down here. Um, and you can see that the proposed grade line shown here in bold over the existing grades, um, we will be widening this lower portion that has previously been straightened um, and regrading in some of the meanders in this portion of the creek. Um, in addition to a secondary overflow or what we call braided section of channel, um, this will increase the width of the riparian zone, uh, restore more natural hydraulic conditions, uh, and with this increased meander, we actually reduce the overall slope of this section of channel and allow for um, more regular inundation of the flood terraces and secondary channels um, to provide greater infiltration of storm runoff and treatment of storm runoff. The fill material that will be removed from this section of channel will be used on site to construct an upland wetland feature. Um, it'll be approximately 7,000 square feet um, and be seasonally wet from runoff from the upslope properties and adjacent hillsides. This feature will provide additional habitat diversity on site um, through additional wetland habitat, but also provide additional capture and infiltration of, st of storm runoff. Uh, lastly, sections of eroded creek banks and channel bed will be addressed. Um, we'll be laying back creek banks and also rebuilding sections of stream channel with natural stream bed material, cobbles, and boulders. 
um, both to address fish passage and to reduce future channel inc incision. And so in summary, um, those are the project conditions and goals at this point. We're aiming to start construction sometime in the beginning of August. And we're expecting about three months to complete the construction phase, the civil contract, um, and two months to complete the landscape. And with some overlap there, we hope to have the project complete by the end of November. And lastly, the budget and the contracts that we are seeking approval of today. Uh, the project was bid under two separate contracts, one for the civil portion of the project and one for the landscape portion of the project. Um, it was a competitive process. We had five bids submitted for the civil contract and three bids submitted for the landscape contract. Um, we are recommending that council award the civil contract to Shaw Contracting and Company and the landscape contract to Recon Environmental. Uh, with additional costs for construction oversight by Questa Engineering, our consultant design engineer, as well as public works staff, uh, we are coming in at a total budget of $1,090,000 to implement this project. And that's, that's it. If we have any questions. Do we have any speaker slips on this? No. So uh, there's no public speaker slips. It's to the council. Um, I, I actually, I know we're focusing on Barger Canyon, but I, I guess I have a question about the watershed in general. Um, I had a, recently had a conversation with Eddie Harris from Urban Creeks, and uh, you know, in light of the appeal that happened, and I think there there's still some good questions about what happens in other parts. I know we're looking at a royal borough in different sections as we can, which is great, and that's the way we need to focus on restoring the water, the the creek shed as much as we can. Um, but can you tell me, and, and Mr. Kalan, tell me if I'm going a little too off topic here, but the area from basically Hope to under the freeway to Modoc, uh, and I know the freeway and the railroad tracks are there, but there's the Barranca neighborhood, and there, I know there's been concerns about flooding and erosion, and is there, I guess my question, and, is, and I don't know if I can ask this, but uh, the question is um, what, what's the, what are the next steps, or are there next steps or, that we're looking for dealing with that part of the creek in terms of the overall restoration or how do we, what's the next, you know, do you have any update that you can give me at this time or maybe off, off, off site, offline? Is that a okay question? Okay, good. <laughs> or <laughs> you go ahead. I don't know. I mean, I just didn't want to get too far. In the, yeah. If know. it's relevant to how you're going to vote, of course, it's uh, an okay question. Well, sure. I want to know about the whole creek shed, right? This is all part of the bigger picture. Maybe you can, because um, I think there have been some questions, especially since the appeal about what should, what's going to happen in that part of the of a royal borough. Sure, uh, Madam Mayor uh, and Council Members. Uh, as I mentioned, we we do have a number of projects that we're pursuing in the royal borough watershed. Uh, this this particular project we're talking about today is up in the upper portion of the watershed. Uh, we have, uh, uh, as you all know, we recently purchased uh, or, or participated in a purchase of property in the lower Royal Borough watershed at the end of Allen Road, a uh, significant 15-acre uh, parcel. Uh, we'll be back next week, and we're moving forward with a project on that parcel, so we have to do hydraulic and hydrologic studies uh, as, a, as a kind of our technical information as the baseline. That's how these start as well as uh, starting to develop conceptual design for that. Creeks Division was also involved in an acquisition at the corner of uh, Las Positas Road and uh, Cliff Drive. So there's a one-and-a-half-acre parcel there uh, that, will, that will be part of a future restoration project. We have a project on Las Positas Creek, which is uh, one of the major tributaries to Arroyo Borough that runs along Las Positas Road. There's a concrete channel there. Uh, we're we're in um, we're before FEMA right now. They're reviewing our uh, uh, flood modeling essentially to uh, make sure that they're in agreement with that. Um, uh, as to the as to the property uh, right around the well from from Hope to uh, Modoc, most of that property is not owned by the city, and most of it is a culvert going under Kai Real, then going under the freeway, then going under the, rail, the railroad tracks, and then going under Modoc Road, and then out into a natural creek area. Uh, between Hope and the freeway is a, is a very large concrete ch flood control channel. 
Um, I think with the, with the information that we have right now the, and the development uh, project that was approved next to that uh, channel, I would not recommend going forward at this time on a, on a concrete channel removal project there. However, I think we can, since it is similar to what we're doing over on Las Positas Creek, only uh, on a larger scale. So Las Positas Creek has a concrete flood control channel, much, much smaller scale, a uh, watershed. I think we, uh, my preference would be to go forward with that and um, see how that works for us going forward before we go and, and remove a large, a very large flood control channel next to a, a high density development. Do we have a <clears throat> overall plan for the whole Aurora watershed for the from from here this this point here down to the beach? What, uh, Madam Mayor, what we have is we have two different plans that were done several years ago. So we have one that was a uh, watershed assessment that was done around 2000. Uh, you know, it's a thick binder report. It's really a study of the condition of the watershed, and then there are some recommendations for improvements that could be made in the watershed. Then in 2006, another study was done. It's called the Existing Conditions Report. It looks at each of the, the watersheds in the city individually and then makes recommendations. It talks about where there are... Um, uh, locations in, in need of repair or where there are uh, specific problems in the watershed and identifies uh, identifies solutions and direct provides direction for what to do in those in those specific locations throughout the watershed so some of the projects that I mentioned um, that also ended up in, in the city's general plan with direction for improvements are identified in that study so they're yeah okay so there have are multiple a lot of studies with components but there's not like a one document a royal borough master plan for correct. lack of a better word That's and, correct. and i guess um when i was reading about this and talking to mr harris and just thinking and especially in light of the appeal and you know i think those questions have come up is does does it make sense to there for there to be one uh, and, and and what would be the process to make that happen if that's uh, a reasonable thing to do? And I mean, I'm, and also Lower Mission Creek, we had the bigger plan when it comes to the flood control projects and all the bridge replacements, but that was part of a bigger plan, and now we're implementing it piece by piece, but it's part of an overall um, with goals and objectives and so forth. And this is um, certainly valuable in what we're trying to do here, and, and but it should contribute, I think, to the bigger picture, right? And I don't know if we know what that bigger picture is in its entirety throughout the creek watershed. So that's, I guess, the question is, is that appropriate? And is that something the creeks division should do? Or, um, you know, I just wanted to bring that up today because it seemed like it was a good place to do so. Uh, Madam Mayor, I, I would say that it's, it's certainly something we could do. It's something that other jurisdictions do. Uh, but I would also look at, you know, we, we do have, we do have two, pretty exhaustive documents that have outlined a lot of work to do and and um, we we the option would be redirecting resources to develop another plan rather than to implement the uh, the projects and programs that are already identified in those two other documents well, maybe what would be helpful for me anyway is perhaps an executive summary of what's already in place in one memo or document so because uh, it sounds like there's the general plan there's the 2000 report there's the 2006 report there's this there's you know all these different pieces but it'd be nice to see in one spot um, in one document all the different pieces that what we have and see where the gaps are at that point maybe that's maybe that will help me see the bigger picture okay, okay. thank you madam Mr. mayor yes may, may i jump into this point because alan road resident dan mccarter has shown us something it i it's not a technical document by any means, but it was a visioning process, and it's called a Royal Borough Restoration Vision or right. something like that. No, I know there's a community process happening. That's my point. There seems to be a whole bunch of different things. Oh, they did it already. It, yeah. Right, and I think there's still, I know the Barranca Homeowners Association is still talking. You know, there's, there's still community groups and stakeholders talking in different parts of the creek. And so it would be nice to see one document where it all 
like what, what's there now. And yeah, but I, I agree that that should be a part of it. Uh, Mr. White. Thank you, Thank you Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there have been what, th- at least three other projects that I'm c- come to my mind is the golf course was one that's part of this. Um, and Mesa, Mesa Creek basically is one. And, and um, I remember a project that n- went nowhere, uh, that went in a different direction, that was an interesting effort here. And that was the... Um, where it's now Chase Bank, and it used to be Circuit City and all of that, that property that went through a, 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 a torturous uh, review process, and, and it's, a, it's a horrible uh, development layout from the probably 50s kind of thing, and, um, and to try and bring that into the modern times, <laughs> it was so onerous for the owner that what they ended up doing was re- reusing the buildings that are there and just backing away from the the development uh, the, the 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 development plan, plan process because it was going to change because so much of that property would be undevelopable and so much mitigation would be required uh, also wasn't there or, or is one of the documents you're alluding to the wendy mccaw document wasn't there a, something that she funded uh, 20 years ago kind of thing or yeah. maybe longer madam mayor council member white that's what council member mario was referring to it was uh, it was funded by the mccaw foundation it was a, a group called uh, friends of the royal borough and it was a, a visioning process document for royal borough i have it in my office and it's it's one of the things we've referred to as as we're you know, as we're developing our six-year capital improvement program, we're looking at a lot of different sources, um, and that's one of the one of the sources. And it does identify projects and programs for the Royal Borough Watershed. Yeah. Well, it's anyway. Obviously, so many different efforts, and I really appreciate the mayor's comments about uh, how uh, sort of getting getting up to thirty thousand. Although, no, I guess none of those. Uh, Aerials were any were anywhere near thirty thousand feet, probably more like mm-hmm. five five thousand feet. But um, I certainly appreciate if I can go into comments, Madam Mayor, that this looks like a, a neat project. And then the purchase of this property was what ten years ago, eight years ago, something like that. That uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member White, the purchase was in December two thousand thirteen. Okay, so, so gosh, see how two and a half time two and a half fly, years right? ago. Yeah. All right, uh, Member, it's been talked about anyway. And I guess what sticks out for me is uh, this is unco- usually uh, Mr. Benson is so into leverage and that this is not a leverage project here. It's just one where you're just having to pay every dollar or we're having to pay every dollar that's going forward uh, with this project. So I'm sure that you, you looked under proverbial rocks for grants and that they just weren't forthcoming. It's a neat project. It's one great uh, step going forward and certainly... I'll be supporting it. So I guess, Ms. Maria, what you were mentioning was not what I was thinking of. So you were mentioning the old, um, the, the, from funded from the McCaw Foundation. I still think there's, there's still a group meeting of different stakeholders around Aurora Borough who I think are bringing in those components as well, but still talking about what's next, I guess, right? So, uh, yes, Madam I, Mayor, and, I, and I've been meeting right. with them regularly. Good, yes. okay. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of different pieces. It'd be nice to put together. Um, Mr. Hotchkiss and then Ms. Murillo and then Mr. Fr- uh, Dominguez. Question. Uh, this is Barger Canyon here? Yeah. Madam Mayor, Council Member Hotchkiss, yes. yes. And is this, the, uh, is this a photo of where what we propose here is, will take place? Yes. Talk me through how this will change. How will it look differently? Um, yeah, so this, this picture is taken from the upper end of the watershed looking back downstream to the southern end of the property. Right. Um, and so in this area, because we do have some recovery of this native willow thicket, there won't be a lot of change. This section still has some of its meander, as you can see. Um, we'll be rebuilding localized sections of eroded creek banks and removing structures you can't even see that are down in the creek bed. Um, but yeah, I can Yeah, because this show... is gorgeous right here. <laughs> I can show, um, we have a few other photos we tacked on here. This is the lower portion of the creek um, where there is no riparian vegetation. The creek, it's even hard to tell, is here flowing left to right um, in this lower straightened section of the channel that is going to look really different as we widen this and bring in some meanders and revegetate it with dense riparian species. Is that where the 
it doesn't have the meander anymore. Is that what Correct. You're about? Yeah, this is that. It's been artificially straightened, and there's some concrete and rubble. Um, so what'll happen it. there? If we just as this, we look at it here. Yeah. So this this channel right now is about 15 feet wide, and the channel we're proposing to build will be between 40 and 60 feet wide. Um, it'll be much wider, and there will actually be two channels. There will be what we call a, a high flow channel, your nor your low flow channel, which is your where your normal flows go, and when storm flows come up, there will actually be a secondary channel, which is like a braided section of river with vegetated islands um, in between. Um, I think I might have. Some oh, would, you, would you say it will, it will have more of a natural look here than, than yes. what we see here? Yes, much more natural look. So these are some cross sections of what that area will look like. You'll have broad, wide sections um, where your low flow channel is over here, but just on the two year storm event, we'll have flooding out across this flood terrace. So um, overall, do we expect this will increase flow or will it really have any effect on, on that? It really won't have. We've done some flood modeling as part of the project, um, and, and it's been shown that Sorry, it, won't, say no, not really it will yet. not increase flood elevations at, as far as the modeling that we've done. And are we worried down below that we might overcharge that area, in particular where it goes under the freeway, and we're worried about flooding through that? Was it a 12 foot culvert? I can't remember. Um, currently, yes, that culvert is the construction point. Um, I think our engineer's analysis showed that uh, there was flooding um, over last, or over 192 on just the 20-year storm event because that, that culvert is the construction point. Um, if anything, our project is going to be um, allowing for more infiltration of those peak runoff events Please through slow, the detention have less basin. Have there maybe then? Or Potentially. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. And Madam Mayor and Council Member Hotchkiss, so uh, if you're asking about flood flows, yes, uh, the project won't increase the flood surface elevation. It will spread the water out. So in, in a lower uh, lower level storm, you'll see you'll, you will see a lot more infiltration going into the ground, staying away from that culvert, which is undersized. Less flow right there. Less flow right there at in those in those heavy storms in a in a flood type event. Um, in a normal rain year, the upper portion of this of the of a royal borough on this property uh, generally will have water in it all year long when it comes down into the lower section it's it's really exposed i mean from foothill road it looks like just a, a drainage ditch and um and in fact it was basically built rebuilt reconstructed that way at one time once we have more canopy over that area, we might expect to see, you know, low level of water flow coming through there more, uh, for a longer period during the year. It won't be year round, but it'll still be seasonal. Dep we expect depends on depends on what kind of rain we get. Rain, okay, great. <laughs> yeah. I think like so much. Is that rain? Sorry, um, didn't know what that was. Miss Mario, well, I'd like to make a motion. Sure. Oh, okay, thank you. I thought there was other people. There are, but you can still make a motion. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to move uh, staff recommendation A through F, and uh, just excited about the project. I don't think anybody's up here saying yay, but um, it's a, a, a public project to recharge groundwater, restore natural function, restore natural beauty, uh, water quality, and it connects to the ocean. Yay. So there's my motion. So the motion's for A through F with a yay. Is there a second? Okay, second by heart. Um, and then Mr. Dominguez. I think uh, Council Member Mario may have answered one of my questions, which was going back to the goals because someone mentioned flooding. And the goals, as far as I can tell, unless it's the returning channel meandering, is one of the goals here to prevent flooding down the system? Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Dominguez, it's it's often complicated for us when we're doing these problem projects. Obviously, one, our, obviously we don't want to increase flooding or cause an, uh, a flood hazard. When we do this, we work closely with the Santa Barbara County Flood Control District, and oftentimes their direction to us is to not change the flood elevation. So they they will ask us to neither. Um, improve flood control for the surrounding area or or make it worse and so and the reason for that uh, to put it simply is sometimes if you change the flood capacity in in one area and, the, and you change flood control in one area you're putting more water in another in another area and may cause flooding somewhere else and so we generally try to work with them to make sure that we're not um, we're not creating any kind of flood 
flooding problems or we're not exacerbating an existing problem. But uh, wh where we can improve things, we always do, but we do that in conjunction with our partner. And do you have this slide? This was in the report. I'm not sure if it was if it's something you can put on the screen. I we ha don't have that I think, exact. I think we have something close to that, but we don't have that exact slide. And, and the reason I wanted to, to pull that up is it shows the county line and the city limits, and then it shows development around the canyon. And so this is city property, but it's it's all located except that lower right-hand corner on in the county, not the city. Is that correct? Madam Mayor, Council, Council Member Dominguez, the, yes. The, in fact, um, both properties are in the county. The city the city boundary comes up to a point right right about here it's pink line. oh it's 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 this one yeah. that pink line yeah yeah it looks like it's so, the purple line on this document at least we are um we are looking to annex the the property into the city and we will be going through that process we just um decided to the the annexation process was longer so we decided to go through the the permitting process and the um the, with with the city, the city, the county agreed to allow us to use the city's permitting process for the restoration project. The county was supportive of the project, and then we're going to go through the LAFCO process and the annexation process subsequent to the construction. So when you say they were supportive, does that mean we're not paying fees? Uh, well, one of the reasons we are pursuing the annexation is we are paying property tax okay. in the county. And... Um in, and that probably raises a lot of questions that have to do with the past and history, so I won't necessarily get into all that, but it does the question about flooding because it looks like that street is at Sterrett Avenue. And uh, on the left, La, v La Vista, those are all county, that's all county property. So any flooding that does take place would be flooding county property, not city property. Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, unfortunately, I don't have the 100-year flood map here. My recollection is that it's, it's just an undersized culvert at Foothill Road. The water, the water will pool up basically in that green area, which is not the city's property. It's the neighbor's property, but the city owns a conservation easement over that portion of the property. The water pools up there and then goes up and over uh, um, Foothill Road, and then drops back into a Royal Borough downstream of the culvert. So, in the future, uh, when Caltrans, it's a Caltrans-owned road, when Caltrans uh, replaces, they would, they would probably increase the size of that to keep the road from flooding in the future. So, the county is not involved or supporting this, other than through the permitting process. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, the county is not issuing permits for this. We just work with the flood control and the flood control engineers review all of our plans when we're doing these projects to um, to provide comments and direction and um, and then essentially support the project. But there's not a county permit process that we went through. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a motion by Mario, second by Hart. Anything else to the motion? Great. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Uh, okay, council member committee assignment reports. Mr. Hotchkiss. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, well, first off, quite inadvertently, I ended up at a concert at the uh, Faulkner Gallery on Saturday, I hadn't realized that there's a whole series that the Music Academy of the West offers gratis to the public. It was really impressive. Um, I'm trying to think what else there. Well, they'll come up on the 16th, 23rd, and 30th at 1 p.m. Um, and the musicians talk. You know, they're all like 18 or something. I come and explain what they're going to do, and they sit down and just this music explodes out of it. In this case, it was a piano. I mean, it was just fabulous stuff. Secondly, um, Miss Murillo and I uh, and were at two Fiesta events. Maybe Miss Murillo wants to talk about those. Why don't you go ahead and get, you want me to go? Yeah, one was uh, the so-called pre-Fiesta tea at Plaza de la Guerra, 
with some really nice dancing. I, I was amazed to learn that the Coda families had 11 generations here, including the uh, friend of mine, Sue Coda Parent, who was the MC. And then the other was a very successful fiesta um, media kickoff. You know, those are usually just like ho-hum. This was great. They had Tim Bear, Tiny Bear, what's his name? Tiny Bear. Well, you the were bear. there. You, you, you should talk about it. But he's pretty impressive. I mean, he had to be guided in. He's so big, so I didn't, like, run over anybody. But um, and I got great coverage out of it, too. So Fiesta's was then 28 days. I guess it's like 23 days away, and we're off and running. I won't be riding a horse this year, though. <laughs> Ms. Maria? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, the, um, the pre fiesta tea is put on by the Native Daughters of the Golden West, the Reina Del Mar uh, Parlor Number 126. And they make little finger sandwiches, and the dancing was beautiful. And I, it really, I love the fiesta season, and it's started. So get your, get your clothing ready. Um, today, I was at Harding School with... Um, maybe 20 other city employees for the United Way's Fun in the Sun Lunch Bunch Day. And we had lunch with the students and then played games. And I'd really like to give um, a a shout-out to Casey Corbett and her husband, Kevin Corbett, Mark Corbett. They were there with um, police vehicles, and they interacted with the children and gave them the sticker badges and uh, really... We had a lot of discussion today about police relations, and there they were right in the playground, right with the families and, and, and connecting with the children. The children loved it. Um, so I'd like to thank the city employees that went out there today, including our finance director, um, Robert Samario. Um, the West Side Community Group's Parking Committee met yesterday. Wow, the West Side, we're always talking about parking. Um, and, uh, and then thank you uh, for mentioning the Fiesta stuff. And the Community Action Commission had a, a meeting with the Policy Council, which is the parent leadership of Head Start in the, uh, Santa Barbara County. So if they don't just give um, you know, free preschool to the kids. The parents are engaged in, in all aspects of governance. Thank you. Okay, Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Today, the downstream release uh, began uh, for in the San Inez River. The, the uh, downstream uh, rights holders will drain their uh, allocation uh, of some 8,000 acre feet uh, from Kachuma. So if you think it looks uh, dry now, just wait a month. It's really going to be shocking. Um, the, as part of that, it, it really... Uh, disrupts, it, it, it stops the uh, ability to uh, feed the uh, Hilton Creek, which is our uh, little refuge of steelhead. And we have uh, a teamwork going on between the uh, Kachuma Operation Maintenance Board, the California Division of Wildlife, and Bureau of Reclamation are all teaming up to try and uh, maintain the some two to 300 steelhead that uh, remain uh, in that Hil- lower Hilton Creek area, uh, and it's, a, it's, it's going to be a nail-biter. Uh, there's been f- something like five or four, four t- tanks installed at Hil- Hilton Creek, and trucks are trucking water up to those tanks, and, and then that water is what is keeping uh, those steelhead uh, going. So it's a dramatic process. Uh, I'll keep you posted as the weeks go by. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of uh, closed sessions to read. Item 20, conference with labor negotiator. And item 21, conference with city attorney, anticipated litigation, government code section 54956.9D2 and E1, significant exposure to litigation on one matter. Great. And uh, we'll adjourn from there, but I want to um, recognize and adjourn in memory of a city TV employee who died a couple of weeks ago, uh, Roger Vivar, and he was with the city for 21 years. Um, so, and I think he died pretty suddenly, uh, so it's very sad. So I'd like to adjourn his honor and memory. So we'll go to closed session. Thank you.